So tonight, uh, we want to talk a little bit, again, it's uh, the good things of the Lord in our lives and and how grateful we are for all that he has done. And uh, of course, we hear about healing, signs and wonders. Brother Miguel just gave a testimony that during the pandemic, he couldn't afford his medication. He was on uh, meds for hypertension and going off medication is probably not the wisest thing, uh, according to the medical. In fact, as a pastor, if somebody is taking uh, hypertension medication, I might not recommend that either. And uh, But it was uh, something that he had no choice. He couldn't afford it because uh, there was no money and no medical insurance or anything. So uh you know take a healthy diet and i said okay miguel let's have prayer and uh so he he made a few diet choices but really gives the credit to god for resolving things and uh, he's not dead praise the lord in fact he's healthier and uh, rejoicing in the things of the lord but the uh, the amazing thing is and we said this a little bit on sunday as well is even though this mighty miracle happened, the, the greatest miracle is the forgiveness of sins. And the greatest blessing is knowing that our names are written in the book of life. That when the Lord returns, burst through the crowds, we will rise and meet him in the air. And each day we have to remind each other, you know, why, why do we pray each day, read the Bible, come to church? Well, the, see our smiling faces as we were talking tonight. It's just something that I really appreciate being around people that share the same vision. As I said, you know, you've, you've got your work situations and, and other things and various uh, conversations go on that might not be the most edifying and uplifting. But when we come here on a Wednesday night, a Friday night, a Sunday, whatever camps or opportunities we have, we get built up. We get surrounded by the people that love the Lord and we're reminded of the good things and the promises that God has in our lives. And even though we struggle, we will be struggling anyway, but in the Lord, it gives us some comfort and some relief to know that there are people that really care and want the best for each and every one of us. So with that, as we take a look at things here, we'll just pop open, and I've got a, a few thoughts here. We'll go rapid fire through a few things. Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, and we'll go to verse 1. So flip open to that. Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. And, and that's a key point. Abraham was, was met with the, the vision and told to go to the promised land. And he went, sounds good, I'll go. Never got the chance to see Jerusalem or all the, the promises fulfilled. But he just believed God and went. And that was a faithful saying. So in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And, you know, again, uh, anybody, you're, you're proud in your work, you go there. We hear testimonies of Anthony running around the hospital, uh, just doing awesome. Jordan out there delivering his packages, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and anybody that's involved in, in a work situation, uh, you can get a, a pride in that. Wow, I'm really proud of the work I'm doing, but it's not a grace. That's That's good. You go in, you put your time in, and uh, and that's a wonderful blessing, and you should feel good about that. Verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. It's a beautiful thing. It's the faith there. Verse 6, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord 
will not impute sin. That's that's a beautiful thing right there. When we just stop and think about that, and uh, the uh, Paul when he's writing to the Romans is quoting out of Psalm thirty-two verses one and two. If you're interested in that reference, and and uh, while you turn to Psalm thirty-two. Uh, get that ready. That's where we're going to go to next. But the important thing is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that in these days and age, a lot of people try and justify themselves. Well, I'm better than this, or I'm better than that, or who are you to say I've sinned, or what is sin? And there is a lot of confusion because people and the heathens are raging against God and they're trying to eliminate God, eliminate prayer, eliminate the Bible. They're really happy about that. But the result is utter chaos. No GPS, no North Star, no compass, no maps, no way or pathway to righteousness. And nobody knows the difference between right and wrong. Even a simple thing like thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not commit murder is somehow uh, something that we, we could probably all go, those are pretty good things, no matter where you come from. Uh, people still have no compass to guide them to the point that these are reasonable uh, ways to live our lives. And so the Bible does give us a pathway there. But the beautiful thing is, is that if you transgress the law, if you read the word of God and you go, oh, this, this, and this, and, and this, this, and that, you, you can feel maybe a little bit weak or a little bit low. And uh, and I don't want anybody to be beaten up or feel that way, but I want people to come to a point of understanding that through the law, we can learn that there is the forgiveness of sins that there is a loving God that doesn't keep track of it. He's not walking around with a rap sheet. Uh, you know, your fingerprints are on file for this crime, this crime, and this crime. Or there's no great notebook where, aha, on May this and back in April, and of course, don't forget that time back in 1998. Uh, we don't want to forget that one. And, and there is no rap sheet that God is keeping on people, especially once you go under the waters of baptism and receive the Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. There's no magic antidote. People will still uh, make mistakes and errors. And the whole point is that God is a loving, forgiving God that wants everyone to rise and meet him in the air. So when people, uh, brothers or sisters, a person sitting beside you or somebody that maybe has left the fellowship because they've they've done something wrong. Uh, the beautiful thing is, is that God always has the door open, a warm embrace and a hug to say, well done, well done. And a sinner that repents is something that just has all the choirs of angels singing in heaven. And that's the important thing, brothers and sisters, right, Anthony, brothers and sisters, that he does not keep track of that. It's wiped away. Better to have the sin blotted away than your name blotted out of the book of life, where it is right now. So let's keep walking on and rejoicing in it. Okay, Psalm 32, and in verse 11. As I said, you can read 1 and 2, which was what David was talking about, but let's go to 11. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. And that is why singing is such an important aspect of, of praise and worship. It's in the Bible for a reason. Like, oh, I don't really want to sing. Oh, I'm not a very good singer. Uh, you give it a good effort. You make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And what we find is that that resonates and it makes us it opens up the uh, uh, I don't know the synopsis or or whatever it is in your in your life and it resonates a, a harmony in, in your brain waves and in your your spirit and God feels that and and responds in like kind back towards you to open it up and to make you uh, just that much lighter and that much happier and then when the word of God comes out. You respond to it that much more after the singing. So remember that when you're feeling down and out, sing. 
You know, when I was uh, on my own here in Victoria, there was nobody else around. I had a guitar. I had the word of God. And uh, my daughter, of course, was here. And, you know, sometimes you would just play the choruses. You would sing them and you would practice them. And that would just uplift the spirit and just make you feel closer to God. So that when we did finally start to outreach here in Victoria, I was ready and prepared. And the Lord gave me the words and the courage to go out. And suddenly a fellowship is born. And suddenly we have brothers and sisters here together that are united and uh, together and plowing the field, keeping our eyes on the plow straight ahead marching on, waiting for the glorious return of Jesus. So that's a beautiful thing. Now, uh, of course, in, as you turn to it in Luke uh, 7, turn to Luke 7, and uh, as you flip open to it, we want to talk about, uh, you know, debt and, and who has uh, been forgiven of a debt. They, they should be grateful to God. So if we go to verse 37... You know, back in Luke 5, we had the man with palsy that was, uh, you know, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, and everybody started to freak out. With, <laughs> well, Jesus said, which is easier to say, you know, carry your bed, rise up and walk, or your sins are forgiven. You know, I'm saying your sins are forgiven, and that should be something that people are more happy about. But you guys wanted a bit of a uh, AGT show, so we'll give you some magic here, and we'll get you up and walking. And wow, look at that. Nothing up my sleeve. And and is this the card that you picked? And look, he's walking. So that was in, in uh, Luke 5. Now we get to Luke 7. And behold, a woman of the city, which was a sinner, and she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And that's an expensive uh perfume so he stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kiss his feet and anointed them with the ointment and obviously being a sinful person she was just like repentant realized all that she had done whatever it was adultery fornication uh uh you know wickedness uh, of all kinds whatever it is that was imputed upon her. She was a sinful woman and deserved the scorn under the law. But Jesus took a different approach. Now, the Pharisees, uh, in verse 39, which had bidden him, saw it. He said within himself, saying, hmm, this man, if he were a prophet, he would have known what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Now, Jesus was able to read their thoughts, of course. And in verse 40, Jesus answered, said unto him, Simon, I've got somewhat to say to thee. And he saith, Master, say on. He said, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. One owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. He said, that's it. You don't owe anything, the 500 and the 50. And so tell me which of them... Uh, will love him the most. Simon answered and said, well, I suppose to he that forgave the most, the one with the 500. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, see thou this woman? I entered in thy house and you, you didn't give me any water for my feet. She has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Now give me no kiss or greeting. But this woman has, since the time, not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou did not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with oil. You know, and that's a, a custom in, in Jewish times that was done. And, of course, uh, in the dust in the desert, that would have been something very refreshing. So, wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she has loved much. To whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. In other words, uh, you know, if you come in here and, oh, I'm a good guy, I don't really, you know, I, I'm this or that, then maybe you're not going to love the Lord as much as somebody that was really, really in bad state. Not that you should get yourself into that state. We've 
you know, don't go sin so that you can be forgiven that much more. But uh, you understand that sometimes people don't appreciate how much Jesus and God has done for them. So he say unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And uh, he said to the woman, thy faith have saved thee, go in peace. And, and there is like any of us that if you owe a debt, then you should be fairly grateful and fairly understanding to the fact that, uh, you know, you, you got to make amends. And if that debt is a sin, forget about money, forget about mortgages being canceled or loans being forgiven. But if that debt is sin, that under the law will keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. You know, that is something that I, I don't think anyone wants counted against them. So now if you come and realize that, all right, under the law of sin and death, which needed to be nailed to the cross of Calvary by Jesus being whipped and beaten for our transgressions, bleeding, all alone, scattered were his disciples that said, we're, we're, we're going to be with you to the end. But where were they gone? All alone. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? said Jesus on the cross, quoting the psalmist, but also pleading out and realizing that God himself had to separate himself from his son, the, the, the Lord of Lords, the, the great I am, there in flesh form, and turned his back on him for a moment because it was too hard to bear. So now if we understand that, we realize all that was done for us, that without that sacrifice, without that, what Jesus had done, the holiest of holies and the Holy Spirit would not be accessible unto anybody. And we would have been dead in our socks, as somebody once put it. We would have been condemned to a death and a torture worse than anything Jesus suffered for our sakes. There would have been no hope, no salvation. But yet, God sent his son in that while we were sinners, he loved us. That by the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given after he was resurrected from the dead and raised up to the right hand of the Father, he sent us a comforter. How beautiful that is. These are the things, brothers and sisters, to remember as we go out each day. Now he's going to lift us up. John the Baptist came, preparing the way of the Lord, saying, uh, you know, don't be so cocky. Don't be going around saying we've got Abraham as our father. We don't need any salvation. So don't go around saying, my mom went to church, had me baptized as a child. Don't go around saying that uh, I got this made because I've done all these great things. As we learned on Sunday, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? Be gone, you workers of inequity. Unless you repent, you will be likewise as those that these other calamities have come upon. So we've got to remember that. We have to be humble in that state. But in Isaiah 40, in verse 3, the voice of him crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight. That's God. God is the only one that can make the crooked straight. And the rough place is plain. You know, and uh, it's a straight place. The plain is a plain place. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And then we skip down to verse 30. Skip down to verse 30 and remember this. This is, is uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew or change. There's that word change again that so many people have difficult. But they're going to renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
And as we sing in the song, teach me, Lord, and teach me, Lord, to wait. Now, of course, you will be endued with power from on high, as is written in Acts 1.8, when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and be witnesses unto the Lord. That's the quickening. That's the forgiveness, the complete salvation at that point. Walk on in the ways of the Lord. You will rise and meet him in the air. Walk away. Good luck to you. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. We are going to go out there no matter what waves, winds, or famine or earthquake comes against us. We're going to serve the Lord. And people might water it down. They might go wishy-washy. They might say, oh, you guys are a small church. What we want is a big one with lots of, you know, hey, listen, this can be a big church. Papua New Guinea started from Pastor Godfrey, one man anointed by the power of the Holy Ghost that went there and preached the forgiveness of sins and the repentance, the baptism, and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Healing signs and wonders. People were healed. They could see the miracles happening, confirming it. Other people came along. They got healed. And then suddenly they started rejoicing. The persecution came against them. And one by one, the anointing went forth. And we see a revival of 150,000 people and growing daily. Daily. So let's not sell ourselves short, but let's just be anointed and filled and committed to the calling that the Lord God has put us to. Okay, to finish off, let's turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 and verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And skipping down to verse 16, you can read the rest if you like for homework. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. That comes from praying in the Spirit by fellowship with the saints, by telling others the hope and the reason for your, your salvation, which is, is something that I never want to forget. And isn't that those scriptures kind of reminder that you're troubled on every side. It's like the enemies, the, the odds are against us. There's no way that we're going to get out of this one. How can God help us in this situation? But the, uh, the perplexion ends when we realize the great miracle that Jesus did for each and every one of us. And I get it. For some people out there that might be listening, a lot of words, and we are not preaching enticing words of man's wisdom. We're not preaching a philosophy. We are preaching Holy Ghost and fire and a sound mind and love, the love of God. And that's the beauty of it is that he loved us so much that the odds might seem against you. It might seem impossible. You might right now have butterflies in your stomach because of this thing or that thing. Or there might be the channel or those that are listening on YouTube later. Now is the time to press in, get on your knees and pray. Now is the time to seek the Lord with a fervent heart and look to his redemption and his forgiveness and his path out of it because it might not seem clear to you but god's got this he's got your back and he will never leave you or forsake you until his son returns and all the people said